medcram.com. Well, welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk about lab analysis. And this really is the opening of a long series that we're going to do on the analysis of laboratory results, especially in patients that are in the hospital. Labs are objective data. You know that whenever we see a patient, we talk about a SOAP note, right? We've got the subjective, we've got the objective, we have the assessment and the plan. And this squarely fits within the objective. So we have physical exam findings, we have signs and symptoms and things of that nature, but we also have objective data like CBC, a CMP, different types of labs and things that come back. And if you've ever had those things come back and maybe you felt a little bit less than adequate in terms of interpreting this and how to follow this and a organized way of looking about it and how to act on it, well, this is the series that's going to be for you. This is going to hone your skills in understanding and applying and actually doing something and writing orders about labs that come back. So we're going to go through this in a methodical way, and we're going to talk about the CBC, which you might have seen, where we have a, a WBC, a hemoglobin, a hematocrit, and a platelet count with an MCV. And we're also going to talk about, in this series, the Chem 7, specifically the sodium, the potassium, the chloride, the uh, CO2 or the bicarb, the BUN, the creatinine, and the glucose. So objective measurements, how to read them, how to look at them, and what to do about them. And the way I like to start out philosophically with these things, I want you to imagine that you are flying a plane. And as with all analogies, sometimes these things break down. But the way I like to look at this is you're flying a plane and the patient is your passenger. You're the pilot. And as you're flying this plane, you can look out the window, and that's kind of the clinical view. When you look at the patient, you can kind of see how they're doing. But, you know, for some very difficult patients, and the analogy is that you're flying through a storm, sometimes visibility isn't that great. And what you need to rely on is your instruments. So I like to think of lab analysis as your instruments. And for those of you who are pilots, you know that some people are instrument rated and other people are not instrument rated. And that's because there's a whole science to being able to fly by instruments. And that's kind of what you're doing when you're looking at labs, any type of labs, x-rays or things of that nature. These are your instruments uh, when you're flying the plane. So you can see what the CBC is, the hemoglobin, the sodium, the potassium. It gets you a better look at what's going inside the patient but they have to be interpreted in light of what's going on clinically with the patient. And the best example that I can think of is imagine you have a plane that is taking off and you have a plane that is coming in for landing. Okay? In both of these situations, the airspeed is less. The flaps are down in both cases and the altitude is also about the same. So in other words, the instruments would look almost identical. Even the wheels are down. But the planes are doing completely different things. One is taking off and the other one is landing. For instance, you can have the same sodium. Let's say the sodium is 140 on one patient and it's 140 on the other. But let's say it came down from 145 down to 140. But in the other situation, it was 135 and it was going up to 140. So the point here is, is that whenever you get labs back on a piece of paper, it's a snapshot. It's a point in time of what's going on with your patient. And the most powerful way to look at labs is looking at previous labs. So I always like to trend because in most situations, there's a range around some sort of normalcy. So if, let's take sodium for instance. The low limit for sodium is 135, the high limit is 145. And of course 140 is right in the middle. So you can look at that lab and let's say you've got a 144. And that's a normal value. And you might not think anything of it, but if you were to look the previous day and saw that it was 139, and the previous day to that it was 135, all of those technically are normal values. But you can clearly see that by tomorrow, you're gonna to have a problem with hypernatremia. And so that's the example that I use. And we can do an example for each one of these. So again, you need to look at the trends on these things and be proactive, especially if you're dealing with patients in the intensive care unit.
All right, the other thing too is, of course, when you're flying a plane, you can continuously look at these instruments. You can see how fast the altimeter, for instance, is, is increasing or decreasing. You can see how fast your airspeed is changing. Well, that's a different situation than when you're doing labs. You are the one who chooses what labs you get, and you are the one that chooses how frequently you get those labs. So part of analyzing labs is knowing how frequently you need to have these labs checked and which labs it is that you need to have. So obviously a pilot sitting in his plane doesn't decide what instruments are going to be working. Those are the instruments that come with the plane, and those are the ones that are there, and they're there all the time. It's a little bit trickier with labs because you have to decide what labs you get. And there's some diagnoses, for instance, like a pulmonary embolism, where unless you think about the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, you typically won't get the right diagnosis. You usually won't get the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism unless you get a CT angio. You typically won't know if a patient is anemic unless you order a CBC. And you usually won't know if a patient is hypercapnic unless you order an ABG. So that's the added complexity to what we're going to discuss in this whole series, is knowing when to order tests and knowing how to utilize those tests. So that brings us to another situation, and that's lab errors. So, you know, when you're flying on a plane and you have instruments, it's pretty obvious if the instrument is failing you or it's not working correctly. Not so obvious in the lab world. So the published data is that about 0.45% of all the labs have a significant error rate to them and are therefore incorrect. And most of those have to do not with the machine itself that's running the labs, but how it's drawn or if patients' blood samples get mixed up. So in other words, you might have, let's see here on a graph, a, a potassium that's going along like this, and then all of a sudden it goes up and then it comes back down again. Okay, That's just not clinically feasible. It could be that a patient sample got mixed up with a nearby patient, resulting in a lab error. So here's another difference between pilots and yourself, who's looking at these lab values. Pilots, generally speaking, are told to trust their instruments. Okay, Why is that? Because when they're up there and they can't see, it feels like they're the right side up but they may not be because of centripetal forces and things of that nature. So they're always told to trust their instruments, even when what they see outside the window is telling them something different. Well, that's a little bit different here in clinical medicine. Because errors can happen, you've got to couple that with what you're seeing clinically. So if it doesn't make sense clinically, my advice is to repeat the lab test to confirm it before acting on something that's clearly out of the ordinary. So in other words, don't put 100% trust in the lab values that you get. So for instance, what can happen is you draw blood in a patient's arm and there may be an IV infusing or maybe a central line, for instance, and you're taking blood out of that central line. If, for instance, that patient has a lot of D5 running through it and you draw blood up here, you're going to notice that your glucose is gonna be high, okay? The other thing can happen if there's potassium running, you might have a high potassium. Or if you draw it out of a central line and you don't waste enough blood, that could cause a, a difference in potassium. And we'll get into some examples of this. For instance, if the potassium is really high and kind of at the ordinary, what you can do is you can always order an EKG and see if there are peak T waves. If there are peak T waves, that confirms and triangulates the fact that perhaps you've got a hyperkalemia situation. If it doesn't, then you know you probably got some time and you may want to repeat it, as opposed to just acting on it immediately with K-exalate and bicarb, and in fact the patient's potassium is normal and you cause a different problem with hypokalemia instead. Okay, so the four points that I want you to get out of this first lecture, sort of the introduction and the philosophy of lab data, is... These are objective measurements, and they're meant to complement the clinical impression. So you need to put together this data with what it is that you see in front of you. That's number one. Number two is always trend this data because it's in the trends that tells you where things are moving, not just the snapshot data that you get. To trend it is much more powerful. Number three, labs can be wrong. So remember to trust the lab data, but to verify it. So if it looks wrong, repeat it.
And then the other thing that I want you to be aware of in terms of the complexity is you got to think about what it is that you want to see on the patient and what blood tests you want to order, but also how often you need to see it. So how often do you think it's going to change? And when do you want to know that change? Is it good to know eight hours after the event? If not, then order at Q4 and be cognizant of that. And then you should probably, as a number five, think about your outliers. In other words, how low does something have to be or how high does something have to be before you're going to act on it? So for instance, a hemoglobin of less than seven is going to make you want to transfuse blood. Just make sure you put in an order for that so you get the call on that. Okay, thanks for joining us for this first video. We're going to jump in with CBC next video.